Good morning, everyone, and warm welcome to the second day of this really exciting conference on neuromuscular disorders. And we are living in such times that science brings hope. And I think that our next speaker, the first speaker of today, uh, Professor Blase Koritsnik, is um, um, will. Oh, start with the with, with the presentation that shows it clearly. Um, it's about the use of registries. Registries are a big thing for rare diseases, and uh, Professor Kritnik will tell us about the um, the use of registries for ALS. So, uh, Professor Kritnik, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, very nice introduction. I indeed uh, want to uh, use the opportunity to show how important are the uh, disease registries, especially in the field of rare diseases. Uh, I will show you um, how we uh, started um, setting up the registry. It's still a work in progress and um, uh, there are still future developments ahead of us, and uh, I will also show some examples uh, uh, which I think are important uh, when thinking about um, using uh, and implementing the registries for uh, daily uh, clinical use uh, to help uh, people with different uh, neuromuscular diseases. I work at the Ljubljana ALS Center. Uh, this is a center at uh, the University Medical Center Ljubljana that was established in 2002 uh, based on the at the Institute of Clinical Neurophysiology and uh, it is the the, the larger uh, the, the the basically the main center for neuromuscular uh, diseases uh, in Slovenia and also the center where we see most of the Slovenian ALS patients. So in a way, uh, it is uh, uh, quite a useful setup to uh, really have uh, an overview of uh, the whole population of um, ALS in Slovenia. And that's why uh, it's a good background to set up a registry uh, for this disease. Um, one of the main characteristics of ALS is that it's very heterogeneous. Although we use the same name for different uh, presentations, uh, uh, there are um, different uh, patients' paths. As you can see, all these lines, they describe individual functional decline associated with this disease. Uh, but as you can see, uh, there are people who um, have a very um, fast progress progression of the disease. Um, and there are, there are people who have uh, a very steady uh, uh, disease, uh, which means that it does not uh, get worse over the months or even over the years. Uh, the left side uh, is the data from Ljubljana, from our center, and the right side is a German group. Uh, uh, as you can see uh, throughout the world, uh, the stories of uh, functional decline of ALS are very similar. Uh, so this heterogeneity uh, is one of the most important aspects of the disease which makes uh, uh, both uh, treatment approach, clinical approaches uh, much more difficult because um, we are dealing with uh, a lot of differences so it's much more difficult to show if any uh, approach, any treatment approach, approach is successful. It would be uh, definitely faster and easier for uh, uh, research if we, we would have a disease that is very uniform, so uh, the, a disease that would uh, present uh, in, um, in all the patients um, in a similar manner. But as you can see, this is not the case in ALS. Why is this so? Uh, one answer lies in the biological um, background of the disease. As you can see on this image, uh, there are many uh, different aspects uh, that can all lead to the disease itself. Uh, 
there can be something wrong with the uh, problems of uh, uh, transport along the nerve, uh, with the uh, uh, production of different substances, uh, with the toxicity of uh, <clears throat> different cells that are surrounding the nerve cells. So many, many different uh, mechanisms are involved and can produce the disease and can contribute to the disease. And that's why we probably also see such different uh, clinical presentations for the disease because there is not a single mechanism that would lead to this disease. Uh, and the reason uh, lies also in the genetic, genetic code of the disease. This is an image, a graph, where you can see all different or many different genes that can cause or contribute to the development of the, of the disease which means that uh, one can have uh, different reasons why the disease develops over time. The two largest circles represent the two most common genes that are involved in ALS. Uh, as you can see, the commonest one named c 9 or 72 was only discovered uh, less than 10 years ago. The first one, which is the second most common, is the SOD1 mutation. The SOD1 gene, that was the first gene that was discovered uh, to cause ALS uh, back in the 90s. This is a huge list of different drugs. All these drugs have been tested within the past 20 or more years using different clinical studies placebo-controlled, double-blind studies where they try to show if there is an effect on disease progression. Uh, so many, many different drugs uh, have been tested. Uh, unfortunately, uh, only th the three that are marked here have shown some effect. Uh, so we are still uh, in this big quest of finding the right drug for the disease. We all wish to find the solution to stop the disease, to prevent the disease. disease. But unfortunately, at this point, uh, we still don't have very good solutions for this. Uh, out of those three drugs, uh, two have been registered so far for treatment. Uh, Rilozol has been, has been around for over 20 years now. Daravon uh, was only registered in the States and in Japan. It was not registered in Europe. Uh, as you can see on these graphs, uh, both uh, drugs do have some effect on disease progression. They both slow the disease to a certain point, but the effect uh, of the drugs is uh, by no means large. Uh, this is the difference between the red and the blue line. Uh, the blue line being the group that was receiving placebo, so no act active treatment, no active drug, and the red, wine, the red uh, uh, line is the, the treatment line in both uh, Rilozone and Adaron, and you see that the disease progress is slower, but th that th this difference is uh, relatively small. So uh, at this point, uh, this is the, uh, the most effective uh, drug treatment uh, that we know so far. I think the, the future is bright though, but uh, this is the present moment. But not only the drugs uh, affect the course of the disease. There are many different factors that also affect how the disease develops and pro uh, progresses and um, they all affect survival um, of people who get the disease. Uh, this is uh, uh, a list of m many of these factors that all show some uh, relation to the disease progression. For example, it is important uh, at what age uh, one gets the disease. If uh, the, the person is older, the disease will progress faster. Uh, then uh, if one has dementia, which can also be part of uh, motor neuron disease, ALS, uh, this is also something that will cause the disease to go faster. Uh, how much one, uh, how much there is weight loss at the beginning of the disease. Uh, there was a, a small effect of smoking. Um, um, so smokers uh, uh, have, uh, uh, the disease progresses faster. Uh, but also, uh, and maybe uh, very important, the last three points on the list here, non-invasive ventilation. Uh, 
in someone who develops uh, respiratory problems, uh, using non-invasive ventilation can affect survival and can help uh, uh, to, uh, say, to to have it has an effect on the uh, prognosis of the disease. Also, gastrostomy. If one has problems with swallowing, gastrostomy will help and will affect survival. And also, uh, that's something that I will talk about in the afternoon, multidisciplinary center care, which means that if we organize care for people with ALS in a, a way of uh, having multidisciplinary teams, this will affect survival too. In Ljubljana, uh, we have started with our center back in 2002. And this is also uh, the time when we started collecting data about uh, patients that were seen at our center, that were followed and treated at our center. Uh, there can be many different approaches to how we collect uh, and store and analyze data. And the way uh, that we have decided to go is to use our own um, system, information system that was uh, set up and is being used at our institute. And uh, what, uh, what something that I have already mentioned before is that uh, we do follow most of the uh, Slovenian ALS patients, which would be probably over 90% of all uh, people with ALS in Slovenia. Uh, which means that uh, our collection of data, our registry, uh, is a very good estimate of the national-wide uh, um, registry, although it's officially not national-wide. A good, uh, a very important step forward uh, uh, was done in 2018 at the level of uh, the um, state of Slovenia, where uh, finally they set a legal frame to uh, have uh, officially um, the registry of rare non-malignant diseases. So this is a registry for rare diseases uh, that uh, covers all of the neuromuscular diseases, of course, all of the neuromuscular diseases will fall into the category of rare diseases. And we now have a legal frame that enables us to uh, collect, uh, store, analyze data for these rare diseases uh, that was done two years ago. Uh, the registry was established at the National Institute of Public Health and uh, the University Medical Center in Ljubljana, so the hospital where I work, work, is defined as the registry data operator. Um, this is an important step forward, although uh, the uh, actual act that was um, uh, that was um, pr produced uh, uh, and um, implemented did not um, bring uh, any financing with it, um, did not bring any real infrastructure with it. So uh, at the moment, uh, we still don't have real um, infrastructure with real registry, but uh, this is the first step that I'm sure that in the next few years will be a huge uh, help uh, and a very good background uh, where we could really use it to uh, have registries for most of the for, uh, for, for the neuromuscular diseases, not only ALS. Uh, so, but uh, since we already collect data from 2002, uh, uh, we have enough data that uh, we can look at it uh, and see um, the figures and try to think about the importance of the figures. And uh, we did publish a paper in 2015 showing uh, basic um, characteristics of uh, uh, people that we see at our center as you can see at that time we had 127 uh, 100 and, uh, 270 patients in, in the registry and these are some other characteristics of uh, these uh, people um, we have also looked at the um, genetic um, landscape so to say to see which uh, uh, mutations or which uh, genetic changes are present in slovenian um, patients and um, we did uh, find that uh, about eight percent, in about eight percent of all uh, the patients, there was a, a, a discoverable change of their uh, genetic uh, DNA of, of their DNA. So we found the so-called C9 or 72 mutation to be responsible for 
uh, about uh, f uh, half of, of this 8% and a couple of other genes were involved. So this is important when uh, we come to the to a point where we would seek uh, individual treatments, uh, which can be genetic based. And this is uh, an important information that we need to have how many or which uh, people are candidates for different new treatments. So this is the step forward in this direction. Now, as you can see here, uh, we can also use a map to pinpoint um, different uh, um, uh, to pinpoint location, location of people that we see at our center. Uh, this uh, became uh, especially important in the uh, COVID era where we tried to reach out for these uh, people and uh, uh, because traveling in these days and visiting hospitals can be a problem, we uh, decided to also offer home visits. So um, we did um, or we still do uh, a lot of traveling around Slovenia to visit people of the, uh, at different um, um, ends of the Slovenia, as you can see in this uh, picture. Uh, some other uh, the data that uh, we collected so far, we have uh, over 600 patients in our registry. About half of them are male. Uh, an average age uh, at diagnosis is 65 years. Um, about one third of them uh, receive gastrostomy um, over the course of the disease. And also about one third of them will receive uh, the help of non-invasive ventilation but only 2% will decide to use invasive ventilation. So this is a relatively small number, uh, which differs from country to country. Uh, and um, uh, in Slovenia, you see it's quite low. Uh, something that is uh, important uh, to tell us about the quality uh, um, of, of the health system and uh, about other uh, things too is uh, the diagnostic delay, which means that it takes 17 months uh, for someone uh, who develops first sign and signs, signs and symptoms of the disease to uh, get uh, to the diagnosis. This is very similar in, in other countries, so it takes a while because uh, many times the beginning of the disease is not so clear. Uh, and there are two uh, uh, aspects of the survival. As you can see, ALS is, uh, is unfortunately a terrible disease um, and the survival is uh, quite um, uh, short, uh, unfortunately, without uh, proper treatment. Um, this is how our center developed. As you can see, over the last maybe five years, we uh, constantly have about 40 to 50 new um, patients uh, every year. That is developed uh, over the years with early beginnings, started, starting with seven patients in the first year. Uh, also, the number of inserted gastrostomies uh, uh, gradually rise and is now at a steady number of uh, somewhere between 15 and up to 20 per year. And uh, similar uh, is the um, use of non-invasive ventilation. So about 15 to 20 uh, patients will receive new non-invasive ventilation every year. So, which makes uh, uh, which means that um, every week um, we see patients um, coming for either new or coming for a checkup uh, with their non-invasive ventilation devices. Uh, what else can we do with this data? This is just uh, an example of how this data can be used to think about. Uh, uh, how, what we do and how well we do it. So we were looking at uh, the data on 30-day mortality. We all know that gastrostomy can help a great deal with, uh, in patients who have problems with swallowing. But on the other hand, we also know that this is a inv an invasive procedure. So there might be also some complications related to the procedure itself. If someone is very weak, uh, a relatively simple procedure can still uh, produce problems and can make the disease worse. So we looked at our data and uh, uh, tried to analyze whether this can be also um, uh, problematic in uh, some patients. And we saw that about 15% uh, of, of the patients actually died within the first uh, 30 days after the procedure. Uh, 
we, and it, this was important because then we looked into the data, what were the characteristics of, of these people, if maybe we can improve the way uh, we do uh, the procedure and um, improve these um, outcomes. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, has been done uh, in other groups across the world. And as you can see, uh, there is a similar percentage of um, so-called 30-day mortality. So it is between 10 or let's say 5 to 15 uh, percent. Um, uh, and uh, it's important then to compare data between centers uh, to see where we can find some room for improvement. So the way forward is definitely to share data uh, between different centers. And uh, one uh, very important uh, uh, registry or endeavor is the uh, Progeny registry, which is a Europe-based registry where different centers share data, which means that we have a huge collection of data and uh, this makes um, things like uh, looking for uh, different factors that affect the disease, uh, looking for possible treatments, following uh, uh, the course of the disease uh, much easier and um, more important. Uh, so. Uh, if uh, one establishes a registry, it is important to also incorporate the registry into a larger uh, data set or um, this would definitely have uh, to be used uh, to um, collaborate. Uh, similar in the United States, uh, another uh, large registry, uh, you can also see what would be the benefits for such a registry. So there's more information for research. Uh, there is uh, a better change, um, a better chance to help uh, uh, create a better future. And also um, uh, this enables us to uh, increase our understand understanding of the disease, uh, meaning that it will uh, help us to uh, look for different um, cure uh, for the disease. In Europe, uh, there is an organization uh, that's called ENCALS, European Network to Cure ALS, uh, that uh, uh, has uh, uh, representatives from most of the European countries. And uh, within these organizations, uh, organization, we also defined uh, a standard uh, clinical dat data set that uh, uh, needs or is recommended uh, to be uh, collected. Uh, and to be obtained for all patients, uh, and uh, this will also enable better participation in uh, research uh, looking for cure of the disease. A recent, uh, uh, a recent organization or platform is called TRICOS. Uh, this is an approach uh, which is aimed uh, specifically to uh, looking for different cure, and this is something that brings together patients, uh, health professionals, but also industry, to uh, have a platform where uh, one could uh, test different drugs, one could look for uh, effectment. And there are also some, uh, some uh, clinical studies going on um, within this platform that also uh, combines um, different centers across Europe. Uh, another important um, project is the Project MINE. This is a project to understand the genetic basis of ALS and it aims to collect and analyze data from 15,000 uh, people with ALS and compare it to 7,500 pe uh, healthy uh, uh, people controls to really search for all these uh, tiny differences within the genetic uh, code. And uh, so far it's been uh, halfway uh, through. Uh, it's crowd, uh, 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 it's uh, funded, uh, so it's a crowdfunding project, uh, so people can contribute towards the uh, analysis of the genetic um, material. And this is, for example, one um, study that um, uh, you see the list of authors, a lot of people contribute, a lot of researchers collaborate, and uh, this was a, a paper that described a new gene that contributes to the disease itself. Now, um, towards the end of my talk, I just want to mention that uh, we do see uh, different important approaches for the future. This is, for example, an approach. Uh, it was uh, set up as a, 
as a competition for different groups to compete uh, if they can use uh, data from more than 10,000 patients to find uh, different characteristics. As you can see, uh, we can use this uh, data and group uh, all these uh, patients into different groups and this will again help us uh, to uh, better defined uh, treatments uh, because we see that there are different subgroups of the disease. And this can be also done individually, which means that uh, uh, this is a, a, a model where uh, we can use, um, as you can see, age at onset, diagnostic delay, progression rate, uh, vital capacity, and so on, and use this data to better define the prognos prognostic um, um, factors. Uh, uh, as you can see, based on this data, we can, for indiv individual person, um, specifically say whether this is a, a disease that is fast progressing or it's relatively slow. And this has been used, the same model has been used on the most pay famous uh, person with ALS, uh, use the data that they had about uh, him from the beginning of the disease. And as you can see, uh, they quite successfully uh, predicted that uh, uh, Professor Hawking had a slow progressing uh, form of the disease. Uh, so why we need this? We need it because uh, when we look for different cures, we will have to more and more use the personal uh, approach, personalized medicine. Um, and this is one slide showing the bright future of ALS. This is the preliminary results of the uh, SOD1 um, treating treatment. Uh, so the treatment for the, the first discovered uh, a mutation that causes ALS, uh, we see that the difference between so the orange line, uh, people who receive the treatment, uh, does show quite a change from the placebo line. And I think that we can um, uh, brightly look ahead into the future because I'm sure that there are effective treatments uh, coming. Um, sorry, uh, I, I, I didn't uh, show you the slides. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry about this. Uh, uh, so these are the slides that I've mentioned. Um, and. Um, at the end, uh, I would just like to thank my collaborators uh, uh, that uh, help us um, um, dealing with this uh, disease in Ljubljana. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you for this fascinating lecture, which nicely shows how data, the growing importance of data for not just for research on um, new drugs uh, or uh, progression of the disease, but also what I find fascinating is that you can actually see the interaction between the healthcare systems and um, and how um, they, they, and the prospects for for patients. So so it's fascinating, and we still have time for uh, one or two questions. So the first question uh, is: um, Is are you oriented towards data, or do you? collect uh, biospecimens as well, or perhaps you cooperate with the biobanks? Yes, uh, thank you. So a uh, very important aspect is uh, clinical data is only one um, um, aspect of, of the disease itself. And more and more, uh, we see that it is important to also have other information. And this can be everything from brain imaging to collecting blood to collecting uh, cerebrospinal fluid. And the newer clinical studies testing new drugs uh, will also incorporate all these uh, biological uh, specimens because we want to see the actual mechanisms of the disease. So we do uh, collect uh, data, data um, or not just clinical, but also uh, biobanks. Uh, it should be part of the registries. And uh, thank you. And have have your uh, has your project been somehow affected by the current pandemic? Uh, or uh, yeah. So uh, an important aspect. Everything has been affected by the pandemic. Uh, the, um, the the problems uh, we have is this is a high risk group of people. 
Um, uh, so we really need to take care that uh, uh, they, they don't get ill. So this has been affecting the research studies. We still try to function as normal as possible, uh, but I, as, you, as you imagine, this is impossible. So we did uh, need to, uh, to slow down a little bit um, to, to put uh, the safety of the people, of the patients first. Uh, and, but I'm really looking forward uh, to, to the resolution of the current pandemic situation so we can really uh, full force uh, continue with all these efforts and put uh, important aspects in front and try to get uh, rid of this terrible COVID war that is all over. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I